Hello and welcome to the Jackcast, the Swansea City podcast. I am Gitto Thwilin and with me this evening I have Stephen Carroll. How are you, Steve? Uh, I'm not bad, thanks. How are you? Uh, not too bad, although I am predicting a um, a, a pretty uh, downbeat podcast in some ways, although it should be pretty entertaining because we do have a heck of a lot to discuss from uh, the last few weeks of Swans action. We've got three games to look back at, but more importantly, po- probably, we've got the big South Wales derby to look ahead to, and it's, it is all set to be an absolutely massive match for both teams. Um, so stay put to listen to that um, uh, discussion later. But before that, unfortunately, we have to uh, work our way through a couple of matches, which um, which actually, Stephen Fairness yielded some points, but um, but but highlighted quite a few problems. We'll go through them chronologically. We won't waste too many too much time on the, on the first two. Um, but we'll me discuss the Bournemouth watch in a bit more detail because it feels like there's quite a bit to discuss with that one. Uh, we'll start off with Blackburn, Steve. Uh, a one-all draw, our record up at Ewood Park uh, isn't that good. And I'll be honest, before this game, I, I would have taken a point probably in these circumstances. But I guess the theme for this podcast and for the last month with the Swans is uninspiring. Yeah, yeah. Uh... That is a very fair assumption. We've we've not been playing well, have we? If we're if we're honest, I mean, even our um, you know, our watertight defence has has had some off days recently as well. So it's yeah, un, uninspiring. I think is a, a good description. And even though, I mean, if you look at it on paper, result wise, it still in general hasn't been too bad. We have still picked up a few wins, but obviously we. I don't think we can, you know, tell our listeners that we've been playing well because that's not uh, an opinion that I've got, and I'm sure you're the same. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, looking back at that Blackburn game, uh, one of one of the key moments was, of course, Blackburn's um, Blackburn's opener, and it came from uh, a, well a collection of mistakes, really, which which sums up one of the the main differences between the last month of the season and, and the rest of it. Um, I mean, Freddie Woodman, his feet have come in for some serious scrutiny over the last few weeks. He, I, I thought actually uh, for most of the season as though his his footwork was really improving um, quite considerably. But over the last few weeks, he's he's had a major dip, and and he you know pa- passed the ball into trouble. The defense didn't react too well either. But then, I mean, I mean, am I being unfair in saying that that in asking questions of of his kind of shot stopping when in my eyes a very tame effort goes trickling between his legs um i mean sometimes you know a ball goes through a keeper's legs and you just accept you know he's he's kind of positioned himself planted himself ready and and he just can't move his feet quickly enough i mean with this one i the ball seemed to go through his legs in slow motion i i don't really know what was wrong with with his feet no um I mean, it, it sort of sums him up recently, doesn't it? It's not been on the, the best run of um, of form, and, and that goal, yeah, it, um, it it wasn't great from him, was it? I mean, it, it was a thought he could have um, he could have done better, really, and obviously that that put us on the, the back foot, really, didn't it? Uh, yeah, but in fairness, I mean, we, we came back and um, we, we got level soon afterwards. Um, we've only got one penalty to, to discuss on this uh, on this podcast. So, Steve, um, w- was uh, was it another one where the referee gifted us one or, or was it deserved? No, I think this one was definitely deserved, wasn't it? There was a, it was a blatant foul, well, really. So... You, say, you say that, but plenty of people were, were trying to say otherwise on social media, including, I think, um, Tony Mowbray. Yeah, well, you know, maybe uh, with this, this lockdown, spec savers and that needs to, uh, you know, allow for more patience because obviously that, that one was a pain. I mean, we'll, we'll all be fair on this podcast. I mean, you weren't on the one before, I know, but it's pretty obvious that the one at Stoke, yes, we did get away with it massively. And I have no sympathy whatsoever. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you don't either. The Middlesbrough no. one was a pain. Yeah. Agree. I, I don't like. I know I wasn't on the pod last time, but I, I genuinely don't understand the outrage about that one. I think it's just like the narrative's been building, and I think we, I'll discuss this as well. The Luton one because there were a couple of very optimistic penalty shots there, which 
some people seem to think were kind of legitimate uh, decisions. I think people wouldn't see these in the same way if the Swans had not had, you know, the gift of the disallowed goal against Middlesbrough and the penalty against Stoke. But I, I'm with you on the Blackburn penalty. Um, I mean, Sam Gallagher kicks Fulton. It, it's clear as day. Uh, and in fairness, the one uh, consistent um, in, in the last few games is Andre Ayew's penalty taking, which um, again yielded yielded a goal. But I mean, not much else happened in that game, Steve. Uh, that was the only shot on target we managed. And uh, it wasn't that much better against Luton. Um, I'll start off with the with the only positive, really, from... Well, not quite the only positive, but one of the only positives, and that was uh, what I thought was a really well-worked goal um, very early on in the game, which um, which set the tone for um, the rest of the game. Um, I mean, we haven't seen much good football from open play from the Swans, but I thought that was that was pretty good. Not not. How do you see it? Yeah, I, I agree, to be honest. I mean, I... When Dander was there, I, I wasn't really sure what what he was going to do. But and if I'm honest, I, I thought he might actually uh, take the wrong option and screw it up. But to be fair to him, you know, he took his time, waited for a runner, and it was nice to to see for once uh, one of our three midfielders getting in the box because we've not been seeing enough of that in my opinion. We've been way too cautious. So, Hurahan has made a good run. He's been picked out, and I know sometimes hurahan has been criticised for. Maybe his lack of involvement in games, which is fair enough, I would say. But he, he's popped up again with a big goal, and obviously it did prove to be the winner. And um, you know, it was a nice little finish. I think the goalkeeper might be slightly disappointed, but yeah, that that was a good goal, and that is one of our best passages of play for a while as well, I would say, because we've not been producing nice, free flowing football at all, have we? It's been our only passage of play um, in most of the games that we've played. It's um... I mean, the rest of that game was was tough to watch, Steve. Um, I've seen some people blame the conditions. It, it looked it was obviously windy, but that does not really account for the fact that Luton passed the ball much better than we did. They created much more than we did, um, and they they just looked like a better side than us. And I, I mean, the only thing from my point of view that that prevent that, that won us those three points were, was was Luton's poor finishing um, rather than anything we did. Because, uh, I, I mean, they, they they just wasted so many good opportunities. And I, it was another game, as far as I'm concerned, where we where we got out of jail free. Yeah, I think we did, to be honest. As you say, they missed a lot of um, decent chances. I mean, some of them were, were self-inflicted, weren't they? I think Woodman's kick-in was uh quite poor and he looked a bit shaky early on from across as well and there was that offside goal that he obviously didn't get uh, well we got away with it really didn't we um he didn't look convinced in there so yeah it did feel like there was quite a few times where there were crosses into the box and you know there were headed opportunities and Luton just didn't really make the most of them I think we we did get off lightly if we're we're being honest and we didn't really test the opposition a great deal but I think this is the thing. Once we do score early, we will just shut up shop and, and frustrate. And obviously, I think we have we haven't done it badly necessarily against Luton. But at the same time, I think a lot of it was down to poor finishing. So mm-hmm. we did have some luck. Um, you know, I think we've had a lot of luck recently, if I'm uh, going to be honest. You know, some of these small margins that uh, seem to have gone in our favour and you know, whether it's going to last that much longer is uh, debatable. But, yeah, I think we, we certainly had a little bit of it on our side on uh, on Saturday again. I swear, like, 90% of our wins this season have been like that Luton game. But, like, just us scoring early and then just holding on for dear life. But I I actually didn't think our defending was was that good against Luton. I thought, you know, we've defended far worse recently than, than we did in that game. But I didn't think it was a superb defensive performance either. And, and, you know, they did have good opportunities, like you said, um, but just didn't take them. Nevertheless, it was, you know, it was an important three points. Um, I, I think if we'd lost that game, it would, it would on the back of, you know, some of the recent, um, recent events, I think, I think it would have been a, a heck of a blow. Um, but then of course, um, we, that, that led us into the Bournemouth game. Um, I'll be honest, I wasn't 
too excited going into this game because our record against Bournemouth is is shocking. I like for me, Steve, that they're, they're the new Stoke. In fact, that they're, they're they're quite possibly worse than and the the kind of relationship we had with Stoke because at least we picked up points at home against Stoke. We do not beat Bournemouth at all. Like it's, I think two thousand seven the last time we did it. And so many of the games we've played against them have been just ridiculously miserable um, and just capitulations by us, just nothing to get excited about. And even though Bournemouth have not been in the best of form recently, like the way we've been playing, our record against Bournemouth, I was dreading this game, if I'm being honest. What about you? I I didn't feel a great sense of optimism um, either. I can't, I can't sugarcoat it. As you say, it's remarkable, really. Bournemouth, like, it's become an incredible bogey for us, really. I remember, as you say, we beat them in 2007. So, we won League One. But I remember after that, later that season, we had that crazy game with them where we were winning, looking like we might steal promotion on the day. And they've scored too late on to steal the game. And then... They- they went, okay. they went on a ridiculous run at the end of that season as well. I think they won like six games in a row. And because they were, I think if we'd, if they'd lost that day, they would have been relegated. Um, but they were still in with a chance of staying up on the final day of the season, which was like, it would have been one of the great like escape jobs in, in the history of the football league, I think. Um, but yeah, that was, a, that was a weird day. Um, that one, wasn't it? Yeah, it definitely was. Um, I think one of the most depressing ones we've had with them was actually even the game we didn't lose. is when we played them the first time in the Prem at home. They were two Oof. up on us and um, we ended up drawing two all. But they just absolutely battered us and it was like depressing to see. Because I remember that watching them and thinking to myself, I'm sure we used to play like this. But, oh, um, I, I remember the atmosphere that day was, was like putrid. It was, it was absolutely like vicious like fans they went 2-0 up very early and it was just lucky that we came back pretty quickly because fans were really turning on them at that point and it was yeah it was not pretty remember that was also the day where they gave up clappers and that's uh thank god yeah. it's never been done ever again that, either. that did not go down well <laughs> you can try that nonsense at clubs like leicester and fulham you don't try it at swansea yeah i uh i agree absolutely spot on but yeah, I mean, I think every time we've been there, especially, we seem to lose and never score. Like, it is so miserable. I don't don't know why, because, like I say, I mean, Stoke, I can't say I hate Bournemouth, especially, but I probably would rather not play them just because it seems yeah. to turn very, very miserable for us. And let's be honest, last night was very miserable, wasn't it? I think, you know, the, the better side did win quite comfortably. Um, but our defending again, wasn't it? I think that's... The, the concerning thing, I think no matter what was happening this season, it's not been easy to score against us. We, we've been, that's the one thing we have been good at is frustrating the opposition. But when you look at the first goal, I mean, to be fair to Billing, it is a great goal, from right. a great finish from their point of view. But he's got so much space, doesn't he? I mean, it's, it's not good enough, is it? I, I, and that's the kind of goal that we just would not have conceded earlier in the season. There is no way that we are conceding that goal earlier on in this season because there would always have been somebody there um, waiting for it. And, and don't get me wrong, it's it's good movement by Bournemouth as well, you know, to take men out of out of the way to give Billing that space. But but still, you'd imagine that we would always have somebody there covering. And it's just a sign that I think. There's a bit of tiredness. There's a bit of insecurity there now because we've been conceding a lot more goals. We're not as confident and as uh, as assured and instinctive uh, as we have been in that department. And um, it's it, it's showing because that that was a really soft goal to concede very early in in the game. Um, and yeah, I, you know, props to Billing because it was a fantastic finish. But you know, we we played our part in that goal, and it was just. So frustrating, and and but but it is a sign of the way things have gone of late. We are much more open, we are much looser at the back, and it's putting us in a real strain. And we can't really win games when we're conceding goals like that. We we just simply can't. Um, but in, in fairness, Steve, I mean, there's been a lot of focus on uh, entertainment and and the kind of quality of football that's been played of late. Um, and well, what well after that goal went in. In fairness, we did try to play a lot more football than we have done of late. And we actually got ourselves into 
um, some decent positions quite regularly in, in that first half. The issue was we still weren't getting shots away, which for me, more than the goals we conceded, was the most frustrating thing about that first half. Yeah, that was definitely frustrating. As you say, we picked up some nice positions, but then there might come a chance to shoot or, and we might decide not to do it or pass and then pick another wrong option, get challenged and a couple of crosses went into the box and they didn't find a, a white shirt. And I think that was the frustrating thing because I think we, we did have a little bit of joy there and certainly put them under pressure, but then didn't ask any questions. And, you know, that's really frustrating. I mean, there was one incident I remember where Hurahan had a chance to shoot, but it was on his right foot. And he chose not to. And you're thinking, just just take a stab at it and see what happens because we're not doing a lot else. And then, you know, we at that stage, I was thinking, well, if we carry on like this in the second half, we might have a chance of uh, pulling a goal back. But then that that goal on half time, I mean, it couldn't have been timed worse, really, could it? I know we've been the experts in terms of timing of scoring goals this season, I would say. But I think we had a taste of our own medicine there, didn't we? And uh, I, I think you probably were thinking along the same lines as me that we would not be coming back from that. No, I, th- I think 1-0. I don't think 1-0 would have been that bad a result at halftime in, in the whole context of the game because we had got, got ourselves back into it. We had been um, playing better football and, and looked to be get increasing confidence as that half wore on. And then suddenly it's it's a very unlucky goal. I mean, it's, you know, deflects off of Latte Baudier into the back of the net. Nothing he can do about it. It's it's one of those things. It's just the timing of the goal that absolutely sinks us, really. It, it, it's such a mountain to climb from that point on. And, uh, you know, I know Bournemouth have been poor in second halves recently. And, you know, we've, in fairness, it's, it's rare that we don't score in a game. So there's always that chance, but... You know, it and, and it came at a time as well when, uh, you know, Brentford were ahead and Watford were ahead. Brentford didn't hold on, but it felt like, oh, this is going to be a miserable night. And I mean, we made some changes half time after that, uh, changed the system, went four at the back. Um, it's, it's something that some fans have been calling for. But I'll be honest, from my point of view, I felt we lost a bit of shape in the second half. Um, there were some positives, which we'll come on to discuss, I'm sure. But 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 I felt like it, it just didn't look comfortable um, when we changed the system. We, we looked even more stretched at the back. Um, midfield still didn't really get have a grip, probably had less of a grip of the game in the second half than he did in the first and still, the front line really wasn't that that effective. Um, the only threat coming from a teenager who came off the bench looking to make an impression. But I, I thought we were worse in the second half than we were in the first. Yeah, that's a fair comment. We were certainly worse than we were in the, the last 20 minutes or so of the first half. Um, yeah, I, I think Cooper did the right thing trying to change things because obviously we, you know, you're two 0 down. You've got to do something and. If anything, you just need some fresh legs, don't you? Because I think he's been running a lot of these players into the ground and it's not really done us any favours. But um, I mean, as you say, Morgan Whitaker came on and he did look quite lively, to be fair. I mean, he, he got a couple of shots away. And you just think that we need to maybe rotate some of these players more and someone like him maybe would be worth a couple of starts just to freshen things up a bit because we do look a little bit fatigued now. And it's, it's not surprising, I mean... You know, we're we're playing every three days, it feels like. And obviously this week we've played um three away games in a row and it's it, it's grueling, you know, it's it's gonna take its toll in the end. So you think if you can uh, freshen things up then you'd like to think it would uh, at least have a reasonable link back because you know, you, these players are being run into the ground really and um yeah, we we just need to try and maybe use some some fresh legs. And I thought Whitaker did look more lively than a lot of the other players did when he came on, and I, I think he could be in contention for Saturday, really. I agree. I, I, he was the one real positive from um, from that match against Bournemouth. Um, he looked bright. He looked like he was trying to do things, trying to make things happen. He was unlucky not to score. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll get on to discuss who, who should and shouldn't be in the team, but I, do you know what? I, I think he's played himself really into contention for a start, and I'd be very, very tempted to start him against Cardiff. Um like I said, the one positive really from that game, um, because Bournemouth obviously 
put the uh, icing on the cake um, with a third goal, another fantastic finish um, to kill us off at the end and, and three nil. It's um, it's not a pretty scoreline. I think it looks so much worse than two nil. Um, but it it kind of summed up the night really. It was a, a night where just things were not right with the Swans, um, and whatever they tried, it it just wasn't. They they just don't seem to be clicking at the moment. And I think you know we we've oh some of the traits have been there um, all along. In some ways, last that 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 victory was kind of exceptional. But I don't know. It felt to me like a damaging result. More so for the way it came about, rather than rather, even more so than the scoreline uh, and the fact as well that that Watford in the other game put put up such an emphatic result. I don't know. It 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 just felt like uh, after everything that's been going on over the last few weeks and the struggles to make things click, it, it was just a bad night, wasn't it? Oh yeah, it was a bad night. I mean, if you think about what's been going on recently. Uh... With the way that we've been playing, I mean, I think defeats are not a huge surprise because, as I say, we, we've not played well recently, and that does feel like quite a damage in defeat. And it did feel like it was a matter of time until, you know, a, a defeat like that probably was going to happen because we're just not playing at the levels that we we need to. I mean, there was that stat, wasn't there, last night that we've had five shots on target in the last three games. Now, I've got to be honest and say that if we were a team fighting relegation and we had five shots on target in three games, I'd be incredibly concerned because you'd be thinking, well, how the hell are we going to win games to pull ourselves out of the situation? So for a team at the top to have it is is really worrying, really. So you just don't see that. It's a surprise that we've got four points from the last three when you consider you know, those small numbers. Um, we've probably done quite well. You'd have thought you'd be looking more like a side that has one or two points rather than four. So, yeah, as you say, things are, are not clicking and worrying of all, we're, we're conceding bad goals. And because we're a team that doesn't create a lot and doesn't score a lot, if we start conceding goals, we're never going to get results because the only way we can get results is to keep clean sheets and then nick a goal because mm. I think it's obvious we're not going to see expansive football from this manager. It's just not his style of play. Although some pundits will say that the, what we're doing in terms of sitting deep and trying to nick a goal is not the intention. I can tell you right now, it 100% is the intention because that's what the main plan has been most of the season. So, I, I, I'm amazed that like there are still pundits out there who will trot that line out that you know, oh, you know, we're not used to seeing this kind of thing from Swansea, and like every single fan in the Championship has has worked it out. Every single manager seems to be you know picking up on this. Um, it's but you'll still hear a couple of people who buy into the myth that, you know, well, yeah, we, you know, our natural state is to be a really good footballing side. And it's like, no, it's not. No, it's not. You know, it's like, this is what, what you've seen over the last few days, last few weeks is just a rubbish version of what we've been doing all season, basically, um, which is just trying to kill games, um, you know, very, very negative, defensive, um, efficient, don't get me wrong, professional, um, earlier on the season, but I mean, not not expansive and not good to watch in any way, shape, or form. Um, but the one thing we did have, like you said earlier on the season, is we had a good defence um, and we could, you know, frustrate teams with with relative ease. That's definitely not been the case in the last few games. Thirteen goals conceded in eight, um, nearly half of our total for the entire season. That's extremely worrying um i mean we've scored we've conceded three goals or more in uh, in three of our last was it eight nine games i mean it's it that that's that's a worrying record because that's meant to be our strength that's meant to be the area that we don't have don't have to worry about we've got that solid back five and they'll protect us and then take a bit of the weight off of the players further upfield but the way we do, the way we're playing at the moment, you know, there's, we look so much less assured at the back. Even against Luton, there were, a, there's a lot more space there for the opposition to get into. We're much less compact. We're much less. We're getting much more stretched in our play, and it's, it's just, we're just not looking as safe at the back as we have done all season. And it's, that's the biggest worry for me because, if we're not, if we're not secure at the back, then we're not going to be winning games. That it's as simple as that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I've said the same thing, really. Haven't I? I mean, when you're a team that doesn't score many goals, then obviously if you're going to win games, you have to keep clean sheets. And if we're going to start leaking goals in the way that we have been, I mean, as you say, I mean, Huddersfield scored four against us, Bristol City three, and now Bournemouth three. I mean, we've, there's no way that we can outscore other teams, really. We A lot of our wins have been one and two nil, which, you know, that's fine. But you know, if we're, if things are gonna unravel slightly, and we're gonna, even if, I think even if we start conceding one goal in a game, that will do incredible harm because you just don't see a score in two is the truth of it. So, you know, if if we're gonna have any you know chance of of going up, we've got to get back to you know being harder to score against and making sure we're keeping clean sheets. If we don't do that, then uh, I think it's going to be playoffs for us. If we're honest. Yeah, and of course, you know, the worry whenever you see a team that's been chasing automatic promotion, dropping into those playoff spots, uh, the worry is are you going to be able to pick yourself up again for those um, for those matches? And, you know, it, if, if we were to drop into the playoffs, uh, which is, of course, where we are at the moment, um, then, you know, you're looking at teams below us like Barnsley, who are in fantastic form at the moment. And even though we've beaten them twice this season, you You'd get a little bit worried coming up against a team like that. Um, I mean, looking ahead to the Cardiff match, I guess, um, in terms of the team selection, there are a lot of players who've been kind of underperforming over the last few weeks and not really clicking. But there were two players for me in that Bournemouth match who were particularly awful. And and I just think they've they've been way below par now for quite some time and they are Jamal Lowe and, and Conor Horahan. Now, start off with Jamal Lowe. There is part of me that feels he should start against Cardiff because, of course, he started against Cardiff last last time around when he wasn't scoring and um, there was he was coming under a bit of scrutiny from some fans uh, and, of course, he scored two goals, rose to the occasion and and, you know, went on a fantastic run from then. But the difference is that before the last match, he even though he wasn't scoring, he was doing a lot of other stuff well. He was putting in the hard yards off, uh, you know, away from the goal. He was he'd had a few misses, but he was getting into good positions um, and and just generally really contributing to the team. That's not the case at the moment. I mean, the only time I've seen Jamal Lowe have any kind of discernible impact in the last few games is when he's come on as a sub, for example, against Middlesbrough. When he started games, he's looked very poor. He doesn't look to have that energy. He looks fatigued, which isn't a surprise considering how much football he's played. He his decision making is is all over the place. Um, he doesn't really seem to have any kind of conviction and confidence in anything he's doing. And and I cannot remember him having a good chance in in the last month. Um, I I mean he's. He, he's a he's a big favourite for for Cooper. Cooper enjoys using him, but the way he's playing at the moment, I just can't see the justification for for starting him against Cardiff. No, I I agree with you really. Um, I I do definitely see what you're saying in terms of obviously Lowe was on a goal drought, played against Cardiff, scored two, and then went on a run, and obviously now he's on a drought again. You do think sometimes in your head, should we stick with him just because he he might feel a bit more confident because he's playing Cardiff because. Obviously, he broke his duck against them before, but I just really think we need to to freshen things up. I mean, that's got to be a big problem. I mean, I, I think in general, low probably should have been dropped a few uh, games ago, but obviously we don't really have the options, so that has made it a bit more more difficult, really. But we, we just have to freshen things up. I mean, you know, we're, we're looking tired. I think that's uh, the the big issue with it, and it's no wonder because. This manager seems to have about 14 or 15 players. And then a lot of the other ones that are on the bench, I think they are literally just there for an emergency. He, he doesn't want to use them at all. So, understandably, then, your your first choice is, um, is going to change. I mean, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how we, we do line up, really, isn't it? I think we should probably go on to that now. I mean, if we're honest, I don't think Freddie Woodman's been playing very well recently. I'm, I'm not saying we should drop him, but, I mean, he's there's been mistakes there, hasn't there? There have been mistakes. I think we've seen this with Woodman last season as well, where he was good for most of the season and then just had a patch in the middle where where you know he he went to pot. Really, he's definitely not been as bad this time around. But but his kicking is where we've seen the biggest difference of the last few weeks. And I think 
he is the kind of keeper. He's very young, obviously, still for a keeper. And I think when he makes one or two mistakes, it it, it can affect the rest of his game uh, and it puts him off kilter. Um, I mean, I, I'll be honest. Like, what well, I'll, I'll ask your opinion on this because Alan Curtis was kind of critical of him on the commentary the other night against against Bournemouth, suggesting that he could have done better for the first and third goal. I thought that was harsh. I didn't think there was much he could have done about either of those goals. I thought they were just brilliant finishes uh, and the ball was past him before he had time to react for either of them. But I think it just, it, it, it for me, Curtis's comments kind of suggested, yeah, this is where we're at with Woodman now, where I think there are just lingering doubts and the doubts are just there and they're not going to go away while he's playing the way he is at the moment. I, I don't know what your take was on his performance against Bournemouth. Um, I didn't think it was awful. I mean, I can obviously he does get a hand, doesn't he, for the first goal? But I think it's a little bit harsh to say he should save it because I think the fact that the the striker's got more time and space, it's from close range. There's a lot of power in it. it that would have been a very good save, to be fair, if he'd have pulled it off. Um, you know, uh, I, th- I think as you say, really, it's the kick in that's been the, the big issue. Um, obviously at Luton there was that pass that he made that he gave away, and then. To be fair, he did make a good save as the as he was chipped, but he is looking a little bit dodgy. You can't deny that, really. But from what I've been told, Ben Hamer isn't great either. So, you know, I I would not drop Woodman, but at the same time, I'm I've got my eye on him a bit, thinking that um, he's not entirely convincing. At the yeah, I think that, I think there are questions about his form at the moment, but I, I don't think this is if if you're even considering dropping him, I don't think this is the game for which you you drop him. Um, uh, I think the you know a goalkeeper has to make a few more mistakes really before you you shouldn't drop a keeper unless it's it's absolutely necessary because we saw under Potter what happens when you just chop and change keepers willy nilly. Um, you know if if Ben Hamer comes in and drops a couple of clangers, then then are we then saying okay let's go back to Woodman? It it doesn't it doesn't help anybody when when you get into that kind of situation. So I think with goalkeepers you have to show a little bit more patience than you would. Um, an outfield player who's who's underperforming, and I think Woodman. I I don't think we've got the stage with Woodman yet where we can seriously consider dropping him quite yet, um, especially not for a game like like Cardiff. Um, I I mean the defence, Steve, because it it has been an area of concern. Mark A. We, we're not sure yet if he's going to be able to um, to play against Cardiff. He he missed the Bournemouth game with an injury. Um, what what's what's the approach here? You know who who has to start against Cardiff? Um, centre backs. I mean, yeah, I, I I think Connor Roberts is um, uh, is is a given for for the right wing back slot. But I th- I think Manning and Bidwell that that one is up for grabs. And who who starts at, at centre back as well? Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think we'd all be amazed if Connor Roberts didn't play. Um... For me, Manning should play. I think Bidwell hasn't been re- uh, great since the start of the season, really. So, I think Manning deserves to have a chance to make that spot his his own. Um, Centre back wise, I mean, Gray, if he's fit, he has to play. Um, no question on that. Um, I don't think Ryan Bennett necessarily looks hundred percent at the moment, but I mean, for a game like this, he he should play. I'm glad somebody uh, else said that because I've been thinking the same thing about Bennett. I've not been impressed with his recent performances, I, and I I wouldn't be surprised if there's some kind of underlying issue there um, with him kind of nursing maybe a knock or, an, or or a slight you know a slight injury or something like that because he he doesn't look and he's he's never been like the quickest or anything like that. He's you know he is kind of a big a big centre back and not as athletic as our other centre backs but I've not been particularly um convinced by his recent performances should I say would you start him though I probably would yeah um but yeah I yeah I, pro- I probably would still start him um but um I don't think he's a yeah I uh, I, th- I think that he's he's come under some um, in for some competition of late with his recent performances. Personally, yeah, that's fair enough. Um, but like I said, I would play him, Gray, and I think we need the height of Cabango against the likes of Kiefer Moore. 
Uh, and obviously he could offer us a threat from a set piece as well. So they would be my three. Um, so like I say, if you've got you've got Bennett, I'd be amazed if you said Gray you shouldn't play. So I suppose then it's Cabango or Norton for you as well, then isn't it? I think Cabango absolutely one hundred percent has to play. I, I've, I've like this is the game that Cabango has to play. Um, I, th- I think aerially he is our best defender. Um, and when you play against Cardiff, you need that. You need that authority in the air. You need somebody who is going to be able to judge that ball um, well and, and really compete in the air. And I don't think any of our other defenders compete in the air quite like like he does. Um, I think he's an absolute must. I, I thought he. I, I thought it's strange they didn't start against Bournemouth, if I'm being honest, not just for his defensive ability, but like you said, for what he gives you in the other box. Um, and that that's going to be important against Cardiff as well. Um, you know, I I just think he's absolutely essential. If we do not start Cabango, I'm very concerned about how our defence will cope against against Cardiff, both both from open play against Kiefer Moore and from set pieces against the likes of Moore, Morrison, Flint. Um <clears throat> Sorry, they've got they've got giants, um, and that's why I'd keep Bennett in the team as well, is because I think he's better suited to uh, winning those aerial battles from from set pieces than somebody like Latibodier, who I really like, or, or Kyle Norton, who actually I thought was pretty good against against Bournemouth. Um, but yeah, my three centre backs would be if Gay's fit, Gay, uh, Bennett, and Cabango, Roberts on the right, and Manning on the left, um, like you. Um, if Gehi isn't fit, then I'd, I'd keep Norton in the t- team because I thought he did um, did well against Bournemouth. But for me, Steve, midfield is is one of the key areas. I mean, it's just been all over the shop really of late. It's it's not been in any way the kind of um, enforcing presence that that we we need it to be. And I'm going to name one player, and that's that's Wes. Uh, I was going to say Wes Houlihan, his compatriot. There, no, it's um, Connor Horahan. Um, I, I'll be honest; I, I've been really disappointed by his contribution in general play. He's popped up with with goals uh, every now and again, and and the odd um, the odd good delivery into the box. But in general play, I think we just miss so much by having him in the team that that I drop him for Cardiff. I'll be honest, and that's that's a big call because he's our only goal threat from midfield. But I don't think it's worth it. I thought he was dreadful against Bournemouth, and I think his recent performances have only been marginally better. I just think he playing him in his, the way he's playing at the moment, he's not contributing anywhere near enough, and I I don't think it's I don't think it's worth having him on the pitch. Yeah, I, I think he could be considered a bit of a luxury for it, this type of game, really, and. We don't want someone like that. I mean, if you look at Dander as well, I mean, there's no way that I would play him. We could just see him getting muscled off the ball. I mean, there was one incident at Blackburn where I'd say he had the ball in a 70-30 and he got barged off it. So, I mean, he can't play either. But, yeah, I, I, I do agree with you with Hurahan, really. It is it is a funny one. You, I thought he was going to be this, like, playmaker-type guy who would get on the ball a lot and and would create a lot of chances, but we've we've not seen that from him. I think he's been great from a set piece and all that type of thing. But yeah, it's been it has been dis- a little bit disappointing with uh, with Hurahan. And yeah, I'd I'd have him on the bench as well, to be honest. And so, who would who would take his place? So, are you and would you go for a three man midfield or a four man midfield? Uh, it would be three, but um, if I'm honest, I don't. I'm not huge on the Fulton. Smith and Grimes thing purely because it, the lack of goal threats a bit ridiculous, but I think it might be a good idea for this game. Um, there's always good balance with it and, and stuff like that, really, in terms of it, it'll be difficult to break us down than you do think at the moment. The way we've conceded goals, maybe we, we will need that, and obviously we don't want to be taking too many risks early on in a derby game, so yeah, I think that's um, that's how I would go, and I'm I'm going to assume you're going to be the same because I can't see you wanting Dander in the team. No, absolutely. I th- I think that's pretty much the only midfield combination that's worked for us this season. Um, ever since Morgan Gibbs White left, anyway. Um, I just I think every other formation we've played just concedes too much freedom to the opposition. Um, you know that 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 balance is very very kind of defensive when you've got the three of them there but it does give us a, a definite shape I feel 
uh, and it gives us some kind of foundation off which to work in midfield. And if you can then get the wing backs bombing forward, which has been really absent from our play over the last few games. Um, but if you can get the likes of Manning and, and Roberts then offering themselves out wide, then I don't think it makes... I don't think it's as important then that you don't have that attacking threat from midfield um, because you've got the options out wide. But the, one of the big differences for me that over the last few games is that um, we've not seen Roberts get forward as much and we've not seen uh, ben, uh, uh, sorry, Manning or Bidwell get forward quite as much. And it, it just keeps us very, very deep and doesn't give us any kind of outlet to play, to play with, really. Um and I think that's been that's been a real issue. But I I just think for this match you need a tough midfield. You need someone that's going to be up for the fight. And Smith, Grimes, and Fulton, you know, whatever the limitations going forward, they're always up for the fight. You you know that they're going to turn up for this game and that they are going to you know put in a pull in the tackles, put themselves about, and and try and make life difficult for Cardiff. Um, and I think we we have to go with that lineup. And and if if Horahan starts, I mean, it gives us a better chance of scoring from midfield. But but it it completely takes away any kind of control we've got in the middle of the park. Um, unless he ups his game massively, which he's capable of doing. We know that he's a better player than than what we've seen of late. A considerably better player than what we've seen of late. Um, if he can up his game, then he he deserves his place in the in the starting lineup. But it's it's gone too long now where he's just floating about really and, and unable to get any kind of grip on the game and, and he is just a passenger for the most part. Um so yeah, I I'm with you. I'd go for the Smith Fulton Grimes uh combination. And uh, up front, I, I don't think there's any kind of risk to of, of Andre Ayu losing his place, but who partners him? Is it low? Is it Whitaker or is it is it some somebody else from right field? From left field even. Left field, obviously. I, I, I think Whitaker deserves a go, to be honest. I mean, it might take Cardiff by surprise a little bit as well. I think he showed a lot of energy when he came on yesterday and just really think, as I've said before, we've got to freshen things up a bit. And, um, yeah, that would that would make sense. I mean, Lowe, I think, should just be on the bench. I think he can, he can come on maybe a little bit later. He should have a little bit more energy then. And, you know, maybe it'll be good for him just to run around for maybe 20 minutes to 30 minutes rather than, obviously, for a full game. So... I would like to see Whitaker come in. I'm not. I'm a bit surprised. I'm saying this based on, uh, you know, um, I didn't even think he'd get on last night, but he, he did, and he did well, didn't he? So, I think him and AU should should play up front. Really, um, I'm going to assume that you're thinking along the same lines. I think it says a lot about how limited our attacking options have been that one good 45 minutes from Whitaker, and we're saying, yeah, he has to start against Cardiff. Um, but but that's the situation we're in. If I'm being honest, I I just think Low is the only time Low has been of any use to us over the last few weeks is when he's come off the bench, um, I, and that that's probably down to fatigue and things that he can't really control. But it's he's clearly not not got that kind of self belief at the moment. He's not looking like contributing anything really at the moment. I just think we're better off taking that risk on Whitaker, and and it's. You know, it's a big ask for a young kid like that to come up against um, a team of giants in Cardiff. You know, some some really physical centre backs who are probably going to look at him and think, "Yes, we can rough him up a bit." Um, but hey, it's a good opportunity for him as well. Being thrown at the deep end, he was thrown in against Manchester City, the best team in the country, and he scored a goal. Um, he may raise to the rise to the big occasion against Cardiff too, um, but. I, I think we both agreed that we need changes for the Cardiff match at the very least. I, I just, I, I, and, and more than anything, there needs to be some kind of, some kind of new energy from somewhere is, is what I feel. And, and that in turn can breed some new confidence because at the moment, I, I, I just, they just don't look like they're enjoying their football. But Steve, if, there, if there's any consolation going into this game, it is that the same can probably be said of our opponents because Cardiff haven't exactly been great of late. No, they haven't. Obviously, they had that um, that great run, didn't they? When uh, Slick Mick went in there, and um, but now they've they've tailed off a bit just as he signed that contract. So yeah, I mean they're in a position now where. I think, personally, they're more or less at a must-win because they're 
you know, a, a good number of points off the playoffs. A draw is not really going to do a lot. So they're going to surely need at least seven wins from nine games to get in there. And they so they can't really come down here and think to themselves, oh, you know, we'll we'll take what we can get. They they need three points, I would say. Which, you know, in general, you'd probably say it's a good thing because it means it'll open things up a bit. But, you know, we've whether it will or not, I don't know. That was usually when we played this more expansive type football you'd want teams to come on to. But obviously we, we don't play that anymore, so maybe it won't suit us. But um yeah, the it's a funny one to call, isn't it, Saturday, I think, because Neither side really is in the the best moment of uh, of the season, and I think if this game was played maybe about a month ago or something like that, then obviously we'd both be on good form. But it's um, it's turned really now, isn't it? And um, yeah, I think this is as it, well. They're always difficult to call derby games, but this uh, certainly doesn't seem to be any different. Yeah, I think we've had five shots on target in our last three games, which is which is a pretty pathetic um, tally. But um, Cardiff have only had six, uh, and we've picked up more points uh, over recent games than they have. Um, but I mean, the bottom line is that both teams have, have dropped off of late. It is quite funny that their drop off in form has come as just after Mick McCarthy signed a new deal. I mean, it's you know you, you had a brilliant start when of this huge winning run. You're starting to think, oh God, they're gonna you know burst into the playoff spots, and oh, there's a risk that we'll be facing them in the playoffs, etc. And then suddenly he signs a contract and, and their, their levels have just dipped. And I think, I, I'd love to think that there's a parallel here between um, the, the run that they've just had and the run they had earlier on the season, which is which is the only, both occasions, the only times where they've won uh, more than one game in, 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 a, in a row this season. Um, of course, they, they went on a four match winning run before they came up against us at the Cardiff City Stadium. And they 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 tired themselves out. They 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 were you know clearly exhausted and and totally fatigued coming up against us and couldn't cope. Uh, and and we won two 0 very very easily. I just think the same thing has probably happened this time around where they've just gone on this massive winning run. But now they've used the same players for the most part um, throughout that run. They've got a bit tired now and they're they're struggling to click. Um, and I I think you know. They are they are that kind of team that they they'll go on a run, but then you know if you don't freshen it, they they're very very limited in the players that they use. They don't have a massive squad, and they don't they they haven't really been rotating it much. And when they have tried to rotate it, like they did against Huddersfield, it it really backfired, and they were lucky to get a draw out of that game. Um, so I think you know there was a, a combination of kind of a new manager bounce. Um, you know, the freshness of new tactics, etc., which got them those wins. But now it's, you know, that tiredness, which is really epitomized their play for most of the season seems to have caught up with them. Um, and they, they were looking tired t- towards the end of games, even when they were winning them in that run. You know, I, I remember watching them, the final stages of their game against Bournemouth and they were clearly just exhausted. Um, but, but you know, they, they managed to hold on for the win. And the last few games, that's not been possible. Um, I say this, of course, I mean, Steve, they say, you know, form goes out the window when it comes to a derby. I feel like that is more relevant for this derby than than most because um, this will be the sixth time in a row now that we've played Cardiff, having not won the previous match. Um, and we've we've often played them on the back of some really horrendous results and performances. Um, but But we've, you know, when you think back through the years, we've had some results which have just come totally out of the blue. Um, fantastic derby wins on, on the back of some really poor previous form. We've got to hope that there's something similar will happen to the Swans this time around, haven't we? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you it really is a game where you just, just can't tell, can you? I mean, I think the, the best way of summing it up is, I think the, the times I've been most confident going into a derby are when we've actually ended up losing. So it's... You know, I think uh, one that springs to mind actually is um, you were saying there that we've it's a while since we last won the fixture before Cardiff, and I'll, I'll give you a good example of that. I think you, it was when you were in France, so you wouldn't have been at this game. We played Bristol City on a midweek away from home, a place where we've always struggled, but we went there one two nil. I think Dan Prattley scored both goals. We played so well, the, one of the the best performances of the season. We had Cardiff next, and I'm thinking to myself, well, if we play like we did the other day, I'm sure we're going to win this, no problem. 
But to be fair, Cardiff did play very well on the day. Craig Bell and we got the late winner. But they probably deserved it, and it pains me to say it. But that sort of shows this game is just you you really don't know. That's the truth. We can, you know, we can talk about this for God knows how long, but you do not know what what's going to happen. I mean, certain people will have opinions on what will happen. A certain man in Cardiff uh, who sits at a sports desk, obviously, who knows everything. But the truth is, nobody has a clue what's going to happen. And uh, yeah, we'll just have to wait till Saturday, won't we? Yeah, and and I definitely feel like recent results have put more pressure on both sides going into this match. And you know, when you look at the importance of of the match, it's it's been a while since so much was riding on. Uh, at, at South Wales Derby, I think you may have to go back all the way to. You may have to go back to that Craig Bellamy winner. You know where both teams were were, were chasing automatic promotion. Um, even more so, possibly than the three 0 at the Liberty um, when you know Gary Monk's first first game in charge when both teams were in a relegation battle. You you could argue that this one has more riding on it um, because the Swans can't really afford too many more slip-ups between now and the end of the season when you look at the way Watford in particular are playing at the moment and just seem to be hitting their stride. And they've got a lovely run of um, fixtures coming up, it has to be said, where you wouldn't expect them to drop too many points. And with Cardiff, I mean, they are now, you know, how many points behind... uh, well, they're on 55 points. Reading, uh, as things stand, going on uh, tonight's result, are going to be in six with 61 points. So it's go with the six points be- off the uh, off the top six going into the weekend. They could be nine points off by uh, by the start of play on uh, on Saturday. I mean, you you floated the idea earlier, but I genuinely think with so few games remaining, this may be a must win for Cardiff. And there, I well, who do you th- who do you think has the most pressure on them going into this game? I saw them. I'd probably say them because if we were to lose, I don't think that would completely kill off our top two hopes. I would be honest and say that if we did lose, I don't think we would then get top two. But there would still be a little bit of margin for error for us. Whereas I think if Cardiff were to lose, I do really think that that would be them pretty much done. Like I said, I think they need seven wins from nine games. If it then goes to seven from eight, you really just don't see it doing it. The psychological thing then as well, being nine or ten points behind, I mean, you don't come back from that often. I, I know that we did last year, being ten behind Forest with five to go, but that literally is bonkers. Isn't it? Like for a, a team literally has to com- completely capitulate and then you have to go on title winning form. And you just don't see that, really, do so. I do think that it's bigger for them than than us, really, in terms of they they've got more to lose. But you know, we've got plenty to lose ourselves. It's not like uh, it's a free hit for us, really. We we could do with winning this game. I think it is one of those where, if it's a draw, I think both teams will be relieved they've not lost to their arch rivals. But at the same time, both sides then obviously it's not great for them. Because Cardiff will have only gained one point and they really need three if they want playoffs. And we probably need three if we want to, you know, keep in touch with the top two. We don't really want to go more than a win behind, really. So, yeah, it is a funny one. And you do wonder if it will play on both managers' minds in terms of uh, will they, say as half hours ago, it's, and uh, it's all square, will they look for pushing for a winner? Mm. Whereas opposed to sometimes you just think to yourself, will look, we're not going to go too gung-ho with this because we want to make sure we don't lose. It's it's an interesting dynamic and I don't know how it's going to play out. Well, yeah, because, I mean, in the second derby last season, both teams went into it in quite poor form and it got to about, well, very early in the second half and it seemed like both teams were just playing for a nil-nil. Like, the important thing was don't lose this game. Um, and, of course, there, there were just barely any chances for the rest of the match and it was it was an awful match all round. I mean the one thing you can say about this game is I don't think either manager can really afford to take that kind of attitude. I don't think either manager can say, do you know what, a point would would be a decent result. And I I 
I'm the kind of person that would usually say, you know, the main thing in a derby is you don't you don't lose. Just whatever happens, do not lose. And obviously a draw is better than losing, but I think there has to be more pressure this time for both teams to go there and get the win because of their positions in the league, um, because the Swans, because both of them have been on poor runs of form as well. I, you, you just they, there's less room for error between now and the end of the season for both teams, and I just don't feel like either side can can afford to just say, yeah, we'll take a draw from this game. Um, the one word they haven't used so far, Steve, is double which um, is something which has been on the cards quite a few times uh, over the last few years, but has never been done. This is quite famous. No side has managed a league double over the other in this fixture. It's absolutely mad. You know, the fixture's been going for over 100 years now and no side has managed to win twice in the same season in the league. But that's the situation we are in. I mean, does that put any kind of extra pressure on, on the teams. I mean, the fact that Swansea know they could make, you know, a bit of club history by becoming the first team to do the double. I mean, I'm sure Cardiff do not want to be the first team to to lose two matches to Swansea in in, in, the, in the same season. It, is that still, do you think, considering everything else that's going on in this fixture, do you think it's still kind of a big deal going into the weekend? Oh, well, it's definitely a big deal. I mean... That that's bound to play on Cardiff fans' minds, if, even if not the players, isn't it? Because you know, as you say, a hundred years of this fixture, no one's done a double. If it does ever happen, then you know those those players are going to be remembered as heroes for the ones that pull it off. And you definitely don't want to be on the other side of the the fence. I mean, any derby defeat is bad. Yeah, to be doubled and make history for the wrong reasons, yeah, is that's not good either. But but that does make it, you know so much in- more interesting from a Cardiff point of view because it just adds that extra layer. As I say, I, I think they-, they need to win pretty much realistically for their playoff chances. Are they willing to take that risk to push for a winner if it comes to it with the knowledge that if they were to lose, it would end the season, but it would also give them then obviously this horrendous thing that we would lord over them of um, of a derby double. So, yeah, it's... Uh... It's it's a funny one, isn't it? It's remarkable, as you say, that it's uh, that it's never been done, isn't it? But um, there's always a first time, and uh, obviously, in the the words of uh, a former Newcastle manager, uh, I would love it. <laughs> That's the thing. It's like, I'm, man, could we use it right now? I mean, going into an international break on the back of some really poor poor results. Uh, sorry, poor performances. Even if the results haven't been as poor. Um, this team needs a lift. This team needs just that jolt of adrenaline from somewhere. And this is the perfect opportunity. We saw it earlier in the season when, you know, we beat Cardiff. It did seem to kind of give us a, give us a, a burst of energy. And I know we, we'd lost the following game against Derby, but we went on a very long unbeaten run then after that. It did seem to kick us on um, for the rest of the season. And you just feel like now more than ever, we could use that kind of, that, that, just a little injection of momentum into our season to to get it get it rolling again. But conversely, of course, I mean a defeat in this match, going into a two week break, that kind of thing lingers, doesn't it? And I just dread to think what kind of what it would feel like if if we are in that position. Yeah, it'll be horrible, won't it? Because you, as you say, it won't just be the the defeat and the obviously being denied a double. It'll be the kick in the teeth of knowing that it could well end our chances of top two. And like you say, you've got to, got to sort of sit on it then, haven't you, for two weeks? I mean, to, the only relief sort of is that, I mean, could you imagine if going into an international break, say, you know, we were all going to, to Brussels to watch Wales, and then you just know that those Muppets would be, like, lording it over you as well. And so at least uh-huh. that's not going to happen. But um, Do you know what? I'd be terrified. If I was going to Brussels this weekend, I would be terrified going into this weekend's match. Yeah, you do, I, I always say you, you don't want a derby near an international break oh. because it's, it's especially just before an international break. After it, maybe not quite as bad, but um, yeah, you. Oh, you after don't after want it's that. quite bad as well because then they're kind of. We know what some Cardiff fans can be like on international breaks. Um, they do not leave the club rivalry at home, and you know they. They, they're still Cardiff fans while they're on Wales duty, which isn't to such a great extent with the case with Swansea fans, who I think were better at just leaving it at, at, at home um, 
more more for the case that it it just it, it, it evades trouble when you're on um, uh, avoids trouble I should say when you when you're away on international duty then um, but Cardiff fans definitely I I don't think it's as unfair to say are much more likely to um, to to kind of stir that kind of stir that pot while uh, away supporting Wales supposedly supporting Wales um, I mean if they've got a, a derby to look forward to when they come back a lot of Cardiff fans are going to be looking more intently at that derby than they are at the Wales game that they're meant to be there, you know, cheering on the team for. Um, so that I, for me, that, that can be quite, quite awful as well. Yeah. It's, it's not a great scenario. It's definitely one of the downsides really of, of having the derby. You I suppose last year one too bad because we had them in the middle of the October, November break. And then obviously we had them in, in January, which is ideal really, because obviously between November and March, there's nothing. So, it would, the best thing to, would always probably be to have the two derbies in that that spell where there is no international football and it's sort of long forgotten about kind of thing. But yeah, um, this, it wouldn't be great, would it? I think having an international break just before a, you know a, a potential Wales trip, but obviously we can't go, so it um, it doesn't matter. But you know, we we don't want to be going into a two week break, though, do we? As you say, with having lost, and then you're thinking, oh, you just. What I always find with the derby is if you do lose, you want another game straight away to get out of your system. I mean, you probably remember the, the the horrible Michael Chopper one where he scored in the last minute. We were lucky that was on Easter Saturday, so we had a game on the Monday against Scunthorpe. And I remember still being a bit pissed off on that day. But we did win, and it did help to ease some of the pain, at least. Obviously, it never heals all of it, because a derby defeat does linger for, for a good while. But we did at least then have another game quickly. But two weeks of it it's just oh god it's uh it's not great is it so please don't lose basically <laughs> that, that is all we're asking please don't lose um before we finish the cardiff chat um there is one positive stat that i can give you um where i've been looking back over mick mccarthy's um record in derby matches because i had a feeling that it was pretty awful and um, and it is uh in his what thirty-year basically uh, managerial career? He's had fifty-two derby matches, and he's only won ten of them, which is uh, uh, a win percentage of around nineteen percent. But you know, it gets worse when you look at kind of when he when he's managed a team in their kind of main derby. So you're ignoring kind of matches between when he was Wolves manager against Birmingham, for example, uh, for example, where he picked up a couple of wins because Wolves versus Birmingham. Is the you know it's it barely qualifies as a derby really it's it's a pretty minor match compared to the likes of West Brom and um, and Villa, um, so when you get rid of the kind of you know the fake derby so to say, uh, he's managed twenty four uh, in in twenty four main derby matches, um, and he's only won two of them, which is a win percentage of five percent. So twenty four matches in games such as Millwall versus West Ham. Ireland versus Northern Ireland, uh, Wolves versus West Brom, Ipswich versus Norwich, you know, huge matches. He's only won two out of 24. That surely, Steve, gives us a bit of hope, doesn't it? Well, records are made to be broken, so I'm not going to get carried away. But I know at Ipswich especially, he he didn't win one, did he? And he faced close to double figures of uh, East Anglia and Derby, so... That's probably one of the main reasons why Ipswich fans absolutely despised him in the end. And yeah, can, and he's, you know, he's, had, he's had some really bad ones as well. I mean, when in his brief stint at Apoel, he lost 3 0 to Ammonia. Um, at, at Ipswich, he, he lost four and drew four of his eight uh, derbies against Norwich there, including, of course, a playoff defeat. Uh, his last game as, as Wolves boss was a 5 1 defeat against West Brom. Yeah, I remember that one. Oh, that was I. Re- I remember watching that in a pub and thinking, like, "Oh my god!" Like, I, I cannot, I could not see Mick McCarthy lasting after that one. It was just one of those where, you yeah, know, you know he's just, going. You know the manager's gone. You just know he's not going to survive that one. I think Pete Dodd and Wingy may have scored a hat trick in that game. Yeah, um, I remember it. But the thing but, is, when like a Roy Hodgson team is scoring five against you as well, because <laughs> obviously he's bloody cautious. <laughs> that says a lot. Um, uh, and the last time he um, he was in charge of a, a derby win 
of any sort um, came when he was Wolves manager uh, against West Brom back in 2011. So it's very nearly a decade since he last won a derby match, um, which is which is a poor record. And I think, you know, he does have this reputation, Rick McCarthy, of kind of not being able to get his team motivated for those big events, not, you know, treating the derby like any other match and not really kind of um, buying into the whole excitement around it, etc. And I think that that irritated quite a few fans at previous clubs, like you said. I'm just hoping it's the same thing with Cardiff. And, you know, he, he just says, you know what, lads, this, this is just any other game. Just go out there and, and play the way you did against Stoke and, and Uddersfield, and I'm sure it'll be grand. You know, I, I'm hoping that that is kind of um, pre-match uh, team talk. Yeah, that's quite a good accent, actually. I'm, I'm quite impressed by that. Um, Do you know, I've just, I've just realised there's something about like Cardiff and York and like miserable Yorkshiremen, like it's <laughs> Mick McCarthy and uh, Neil Warnock. Um, yeah, they've they've got they've got a type, Cardiff, haven't they? Yeah, I think they they have got a, a type, haven't they? I mean, for me, Cardiff haven't played particularly nice football probably since the the days of Dave Jones as well. I mean, you look at Marky McKay, wasn't great. I mean. I think Solskjaer tried to play better football, but he was crap. Um, Russell Slade, not great. Warnock, um, as you say, Harris, and now obviously Slickmick. None of them are, uh, but put it this way, I don't think any of them are managers that we'd uh, particularly want, are they? <laughs> Definitely not. Um, having said that, you know, I don't think we're ones to talk really when we're criticising other teams for their uh, stylistic approach, the way we've been playing this season. I'd say we no, are. That, that's, uh, that is definitely a, a fair point. But uh, I think we're about as hideous as any team in this division this season. Yeah, we, we are. But obviously, historically, that that's not been the case. And uh, hopefully that will be the case again at some point. Let's get your derby prediction, Steve. Are we going to be able to do the double? Or are Cardiff going to... Hand our uh, uh, promotion hopes a, a, a really heavy blow. Um, I'm going to probably predictably say one all because I can't predict us to win because we won't. Obviously, it's it's almost impossible to to say that we're going to lose to that lot. So yeah, I'm I'm going to say one all. I'm hoping. I mean, we have, over the last few derbies, you know, been able to raise our game a couple of times when when it's not looked um, like things are going in our favour. Um, and we we tend to be better at turning up for this match than, than Cardiff are. Plus Mick McCarthy's dismal record in derbies. Steve Cooper seems to understand the importance of this match. And I generally think that we've got a better team than them. So I'm going to go for a 1-0 Swans win, but I cannot pretend that I'm in any way confident. And that may just be heart overruling head, but I, it may be just me hoping that that's what's going to happen, but that, that'll be my prediction, 1-0, 1-0 to the Swans. I would love it if that happens, no matter how it comes. The dodgiest of penalties, I do not care. If that gives us the win, that like I'll take it. I will take it. Until the next time, thank you very much for joining us and uh, good luck to the Swans in the massive match at the Liberty on Saturday. Come on, you Swans. (laughs) 